Paige Pritchard. Welcome to the Midlife Makeover Show. Uh, we're going to talk about money, honey, which is a great topic. And I found out that you were on the Dr. Phil show. And I'm yes. thinking you were on Dr. Phil and now you're on the Midlife Makeover Show. I feel pretty <laughs> special. Oh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And honestly, I feel special. Like I feel wow. special to be the one here today talking to you. Like I know this is going to be such a great conversation. So thank you for oh, having you me. Yeah, you know, well, we have a lot to talk about. We, we have do. A, and we have a lot in common too. But I tell you what, one of my things, I love a good comeback story. Mm -hmm. I love when, you know, someone's like completely like wah, gone downhill yeah. and they come back uphill and you've got a great story. So let's hear your story. Yeah, no, that's a great place to start. So I'm Paige Pritchard and I am known on the interwebs as the overspending coach. So essentially what I do is I help women stop impulse shopping and overspending, but I do what I do today because of my past and my history with not only money, but shopping. I used to be a compulsive shopper when I was 22. So I know that I was young, right? When this happened, but when I was 22, I graduated from college and I got my first like big girl job out of school. And I actually got a job at a car dealership of all things. I was selling Cadillacs. <laughs> Nice. I know. Right. Like of all things. Right. So I was selling Cadillacs and I moved back home to Dallas, which is where I'm from. And I decided, okay, like since I'm back in my hometown, I'm going to move back home with my parents for a year because not only living at home, did that keep my expenses really low, but also the dealership that I was working at, like they gave me a car to drive and they paid for the gas and the insurance and my cell phone bill. So I really had like no expenses. And I also had $40,000 of student loan debt. So going into that year, I was like, okay, here we go. I'm going to be making 60 K. I can really use this year to like set a super solid financial foundation for myself, get these loans paid mm -hmm. off, save up some money. And long story short, that is not what happened. <laughs> The opposite of that ended up happening. So turns out I really, really hated selling cars. Like very quickly into that job, I realized that I hated it and did not enjoy it. And I just didn't really handle the transition from, you know, college to real world very well. Like I missed my friends a lot. I, me and my college boyfriend had broken up and I was really sad about that. And, you know, I, I, I was just like, kind of not like upset, but I was just like, ugh, like living at home with my parents. Like I had four years of freedom and independence and then moved it back in with my parents. So shopping kind of became like my escape and my coping mm -hmm. mechanism during that time. Mm -hmm. What I would do is, well, it really started off as like, when I remember so clearly getting my first paycheck and being like, okay, I need to go and I need to build myself up a corporate wardrobe. Right. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And I remember spending my entire first paycheck on just like clothes and corporate wardrobe, which I was like, okay, got it. But the problem was, is I didn't stop and I kept doing that. And so what I would do was like on my lunch breaks, I would just want to get out of the dealership. So it was like clockwork, right? Like noon would come around. I would leave, I would head up to the mall and, you know, I would just stroll into like Nordstrom's J crew, you know, wherever on my lunch break and just like very casually drop like $500, like no problem. Right. Which is so easy to do there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> easy to do. Right. So easy to do. But the problem was, is that that was happening like several times a week for mm. an entire year. And so really the punchline is, is that at the end of that year, it came time to move out. My parents were like, okay, like it's been a year, right? Like time for you to go. And I could barely afford to move out of my parents' house. Like I didn't have enough money to put a security deposit down on an apartment, let alone furnish one. Right. And so I essentially impulse shopped my way through my $60,000 salary. And people are always like, well, you didn't spend the whole thing, right? Because you had bills and stuff. And I'm like, no, yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't. I mean, not really. Like the only bill I had to start paying was like six months into that. My student loans came out of deferment. And so I, had to pay like the minimum payment on my student loans for about six months, but that was it. That was the only bill going into a month that I knew I had to cover. Everything else was spent, right? Yeah. So yeah. when did the light bulb go off? I, 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 I don't think I'll ever forget this moment of sitting down and going, okay, like it's time. Like I remember having this thought in my head, like I should probably log into my bank account. I should probably like 
start paying attention to this because I'm going to have to like move into an apartment and actually have to start paying bills. And I remember logging into my bank account and there was around $400 in there. Mm. And I just remember like, seriously, I thought my identity had been stolen for a quick second. And then I was like, you stole your own identity. Yeah, I did. I totally did. Right? I <laughs> yeah. And so that was kind of like my light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, like it's, it's gone. I've spent it all. Right. And I knew that I was shopping a lot and I knew that I was spending a lot, but I was so just unconscious around my money. I wasn't checking in with it. I was just like, I've got the money. It's no big deal. And so really it was like that moment where I was like, oh my gosh, it's gone. Like it's all gone. I've completely spent it all. And that was, I just remember just being overcome with like, so much disappointment. And honestly, like the word that always comes to mind for me is just like disgust. Like I was just so disgusted with myself in that moment. I remember feeling that so strongly and I was just like, I can't believe I did this. Did you have patterns of this before? Was this like a new thing or like, even as the, you know, when you were younger in your teenage years, did you like, you get a dollar and you go spend the dollar or no, I, that is such a good question because absolutely 100%. Like I got my first job when I was 14 years old. I was a waitress at a restaurant, which was great. It was great money, but I would literally walk out of the restaurant with just cash in my hands. And it was always that pattern. It was always like earn money, spend money, earn money, spend Mm -hmm. money. I never saved anything. And also like no one really ever like slowed me down to say like, Hey, you're making this money now. Maybe let's put some of it away. Maybe let's save some of it. There was none of that. I always had like internships, like in between, you know, my years in college, I had summer internships, always spending it. Right. And it was just this pattern of even before I would make the money, I already knew what I was going to spend it on. Mm, right. Mm. It was like going into a shift at the restaurant. I would be like, okay, I'm probably going to make around, you know, $80 tonight in tips. And this is what I'm going to spend it on. I, I right. had already spent the money in my head before I got it. Did you ever have that feeling of like when you'd spend it and you would buy something? Was that like a, a bit of a high when you would get oh, that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I was for sure, no doubt in my mind, a compulsive shopper, which mm. compu- like the, the big kind of thing about being a compulsive shopper is you shop in an attempt to change your emotional state, typically Mm. to make yourself feel better. But when you do that, there definitely is this like high, this rush, this euphoria. And I remember getting that from like the very first shopping trip when I went and kind of spent my whole paycheck. I I'll never forget like the euphoria that I felt with that shopping trip. And then it was always just a chase after that to kind of get that high. And I'll say this, Mm. like they've done studies and they've shown that, you know, compulsive shoppers or, you know, people with shopping addictions Mm -hmm. is you know, chemically in our brains, it's really no different than somebody who has like a gambling addiction or Mm. is addicted to alcohol or some other substance. It's the same reaction that we have in our brain. So there definitely is an aspect of chasing that high and that euphoria. So interesting. I just thought of this because now with Amazon and I love Amazon, but now you're almost getting that double high, if you will, right? When you click- that you just purchased it on your phone. Right. Yes. And then you're waiting for the FedEx guy to come yeah. you're like, Oh my gosh. And then you get, and then it's like a, it's a, d- a double whammy there. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, you're so right because they've yeah. actually done studies that have shown that now online shopping is actually, it's like twice as addictive as yeah. in-person shopping, because to your point, there's twice the amount of dopamine release. So yes. you get the dopamine release when you click buy and you buy it. But the part about shopping that makes shopping so exciting to us is really the anticipation of it. So to your point, when we shop online, we click buy. And then there's like this anticipation period where we're like tracking the purchase, waiting for it to arrive, you know, and then you get it and you unbox. It's like this whole thing, right? I know. So it's double, it's like twice as pleasurable to us, which is why online shopping has become such like, honestly, such a problem for people. Right. And it just, it became even worse during the pandemic when people were was just going to say in their homes, yeah. like having nowhere to go and nothing to do. It was like online shopping was already much more addictive than in-person shopping. And then you tell people they can't go anywhere and they can't actually 
right? It's like, yeah. well, what else am I going to do besides yeah, just get on my laptop and, and spend shop. money, right? So <laughs> yeah, you're totally right. Online shopping, there's this like double hit, which makes it even more tricky to break. Yeah. I, I even think about like QVC, um, home shopping network, same thing. You get the yeah. excitement about watching the show and then ordering and then waiting to get it. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. yeah. So for, for people that are out there listening, how would they know if they're an overspender? Yeah. So really I'll define what my version of overspending is, right? Because it's, it's a word that I use like in my branding and in my marketing, but to me, because when people see it, they're like, oh, overspending just means maybe like you're spending more than you make, or you're mm -hmm. spending more than you planned to spend. And yes, that can absolutely be part of it. But right. I define overspending as really like any spending that you're doing against your own good. So mm. sometimes that does mean like, yes, you are spending more than you make. But other times it could mean maybe you're not spending more than you make, like maybe you're not going into debt, but you're mm -hmm. spending money in a compulsive way, meaning you're trying to, um, numb, you're trying mm -hmm. to like, you're using shopping as a form of like escapism. Um, so you're trying to kind of like change your emotional state or mm -hmm. the other thing is, is you're buying, which I know you're a big fan of not doing this, right? Yes, or you're yeah. buying a lot of like what I call like junk clutter and excess. So what yep. I say is like, you're just shopping to shop. You're just buying yeah. stuff to buy. It's stuff. like little knickknacks. Like yeah. you go to a, like, a literally souvenir shop, be... you just have to buy, you know, a coffee mug from some town that you'll probably never go to again. Exactly. So yep. that that's also kind of how I define overspending is like what you're buying. It's like, are you actually buying things that you're going to get use out of that you're going to mm -hmm. get value out of? Or are you just buying junk? And a lot of the women that come to me, like when you're shopping as a form of entertainment, you mm -hmm. ultimately end up buying a lot of junky, cluttery, you know, I know people call them like tchotchkes, right? <laughs> you end up buying like a lot of like tchotchke type things because it doesn't even matter what it is. Like you could literally right. just be buying anything. Like you just want to be buying something, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean- any, any spending that goes against your own good. Do you find it's worse for people that do make a lot of money or does that matter whether they're making, you know, average, it does it really matter? I mean, I would think though, too, like if you are making a ton of money, then you're probably doing more spending, but I yeah. don't know. You know, that's a really interesting question because from what I've seen with the women in my community, income doesn't have as much to do with it as you would think mm. that it does. Okay. Because yeah. if you're, if you're wanting to spend money nowadays, you, you can spend money that you don't have with credit cards, right? Credit right. cards make that incredibly easy. Mm -hmm. And I always say too, like, if you have a problem with your spending, if you're a compulsive spender, you're going to find a way to spend all of your money if you're making $30,000 a year or if right. you're making $300,000 a year. Right. Like a lot of times people yeah. think that their problem with money is making more. And sometimes, mm -hmm. yes, like sometimes, yes, people do have an income problem. Like sometimes I yes. will look at someone's financial situation of what they have coming in and what they're spending their money on. And I'll be like, this is clearly an income problem. You're just not making yep. enough. But mm -hmm. a lot of the times people who have spending problems think, oh, the solution is me making more money. Then they make more money and the behavior and then they spend this, more and then they end yeah. up spending all of that as well. So income actually has less to do with it than you would think. Yeah. And I would think a lot of it has to do with your relationship with money and your beliefs about money, your beliefs totally. about yourself. Totally. Right? And I talk a lot yeah. on the show about limiting beliefs, right? Because we yeah. all have limiting beliefs are all fully ingrained in our brains. And until you recognize them and then rewire that belief, right? They're going to stay yeah. there. And, they're, and it's a subconscious thing, right? Yeah. Just like, oh. talking about, like even going and whoopsie, how did I end up at Nordstrom's and I'm buying another pair of, you know, know, $500 shoes that will probably break in the next three months. Right. Yeah. So, so how do you go about changing those beliefs and changing your relationship and recognizing really what the relationship is, I guess. Yeah. To be no, that's, I love that you're touching on this because this yeah. is such a huge part of it that most people don't ever, ever think about or uncover mm -hmm. and then go to change, which is really what's driving so much of the, 
of the behavior. So mm -hmm. I say when it comes down to your mindset, there's kind of two main things that are going on. You have one, you have your beliefs about yourself in relation mm -hmm. to money, wealth, and spending. This is something that I call your spending self concept. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, I'll kind of dive into both, but the second one is your thoughts about money. Right. Yeah. And I call this like your capacity to have money, but let's go back to the spending self-concept. Cause this one's really big. This mm -hmm. is especially big with women and our spending habits, because just as a society, we've, we've all kind of been conditioned and programmed to be like, Oh, well, women just like men save the money and women spend the money. That's like a big, yes. like it's not, it, and it's really not even something like conscious. Like I feel yeah. like growing up, I never learned that, but it's just like movies and media and messaging that we pick up. And you, my clients yeah. say this to me all the time. They come to me and they say, well, I'm a shopper. I'm a spender. My husband's uh -huh. the saver. I'm the spender. And my big thing is spending is something that you do. It's not mm -hmm. who you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And right. You, and when you like ingrain it so deeply as a part of your identity like that, you're mm -hmm. going to live into that identity right? Yes. That's just how our brains are wired to work. Right. And yep. to your point, it's a limiting belief. If yep. you believe about yourself, I'm a shopper, I'm a spender. I always blow it. I can't be trusted with money. Yep. Then of course, that's what you're going to create. And that's what you're going to live into. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is detaching spending from like your identity and from your yes. personality, right? Like yeah. I say, spending is a skill. It's something that you actually can practice and get better at over time. And I'm testament to that, right? Because yep. if you were to look at my spending habits 10 years ago versus now, you'd think that you were looking at two completely different people. And right. if it was true that like, this is always who we are and it was always a part of us, then there would be no hope for change, right? But spending is a skill. So that's the first thing is like mm -hmm. detaching it from your identity of, okay, spending, this isn't who I am. Spending is simply just something that I do. And then the second part to that is really like your capacity to have money. And mm. that's what I had a really hard, like now that I'm 10 years detached from my own story. And now that I do what I do and I have the tools, I can look back on 22 year old me and mm -hmm. clearly see that that's what was happening because my identity to your point was still rooted yes. in being the broke college student. Yep. who had no more than $50 in her bank account at any point in time. And then it was like, boom, I started yep. making $60,000 overnight. And my reality represented something so different than my identity. Mm -hmm. And your brain is always going to like revert you back to your identity. Yes. It's, it's interesting. I was, uh, I was listening to the, or watching the video clip on YouTube of you on Dr. Phil, which is really good. Oh, yeah. And Dr. Phil, I love how he just delivers, you know, how he just, he's just so cool, but, and he, and you did so awesome too, during oh, that interview. but <laughs> he had said, um, about how we have this truth about ourselves. Right. And until you recognize that again and kind of break, like, is that really who I am? You know, mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. sure, you know, we do, we, unfortunately in the United States, I mean, my gosh, the spending that we do yeah. <laughs> as it's Americans, wild. right. Yeah. And if you're not doing it, it's almost like, oh my gosh, why is she not buying a ton of things? She has the money. Why doesn't she live in a bigger house and have a fancier car? It's almost like you're looked down upon if you're not being like the rest of everybody else and spending a ton of money. Right. Yeah. And one other, when you, when you had reached out about being on the show, uh, I, first of all, I, I love the topic itself. It's not like, okay, it's about making money or what to, it's, it's, it's your relationship with money. And I did an episode not too long ago about downsizing, decluttering. And here I am, mm. if anyone's watching here on YouTube, I'm sitting in an RV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, everything I have is inside this little box on wheels. Yeah. And I've lived in the huge houses. I've had the big fancy cars. I've had all the knickknacks and the souvenir cups. I've had, oh my gosh, like the, the think back of the stuff that I had that was just not important. Yeah. And, and I had that same mindset. I don't think I was a crazy overspender. But I thought, well, I've got some money here. Of course I can afford, the, I deserve these new pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, the one thing that's nice about living in an RV is that 
and there's like this rule of with RVers, what comes in the RV, then something must come out. If something comes in, something's got to go oh, out. I love that. Yeah. So like right here, I have like a little set of pins. If I go buy a new pin, this pin's got to go because this <laughs> yeah. is not enough room, right? Yeah. But it really, yeah. I tell you what though, it worked because now when I'm at a, and of course traveling, I go to tons of souvenir shops and things like that. And now I hold something up. I'm like, do I really need this? Do mm -hmm. I, I don't have space for it. I don't, think, I don't like to have things that are cluttered. So I'm like, if I bring this in, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have room for it. Yeah. But the point is too, especially at midlife, a lot of people empty nest, right? They're downsizing. They're moving out of the big houses and you do, there's this emotional connection that you have to the stuff and it makes you realize like, how important is this stuff? You come into this world with nothing, you're going to leave with nothing. Mm -hmm. So, and the more I think about it too, the more stuff you have, the more you have to maintain that, the more yeah. time and energy, your thoughts, your everything is dedicated yes. to the stuff. You got to dust your stuff. You got to clean the stuff. You got to move the stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, I love this topic of not overspending because you're, you're putting more pressure on yourself and, and the Joneses, right, in the world. Yeah. Of, you'll never keep up with the Joneses, ever. No. And why yeah, would and you that's want just to, like, right? Yeah, that's just, that's consumer culture that we live in, right? Like, to your yeah. point, we, we live, you know, in, in Western society, we live in consumer culture. And one of the fundamental messages that all of us have lived our entire lives in is the more stuff you have, the happier you will be. Yes. The more, yep. the bigger, the shinier, the newer, yep. the happier, the more fulfilled and the more status you will have. Yes. And when you think about that message, like that message, of course, serves the marketers and the retailers, the people who are trying to sell you a bunch of things, because it's like, mm -hmm. of course, as a society, when we believe that, and when we live into that, when we believe, okay, like the more I have, the happier I'll be. And at the end of the day, that's all we want as human beings. All we want as human beings is just to feel better and to be happy. Right. So when consumer culture is out there telling us, Hey, like I can fix your problem. If you buy my product, my product will solve this problem for you, or my product will make you feel better or will make you feel right. this or this or this or whatever. We will go to the ends of the earth and we will spend every penny that we have simply in an attempt to make ourselves feel better. But the reality is, and you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast have realized this up until this mm -hmm. point in their life. Like, I feel like a lot of us get to this point where yeah. we kind of like subscribe to that version of consumer culture. And yep. then we, and then we kind of start to realize like, this isn't working. Like, right, exactly. Yeah. Stuff. You're like, wait a minute. I've been, yeah. yeah. Like I'm getting yeah. more stuff. I'm spending more money. And, and nobody seems happy. to give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah I'm not happy. And nobody does really, does anybody really care about my $500 purse? Right. Exactly. And if they did, then what does it say about them? Yeah. So right? it's just like, I feel like a lot of us get to the point where we kind of, we subscribe to it for a bit. And then we start to realize, yes. okay, this isn't working. And the reality right. of it is, is that, you know, I always say there's a lot of diminishing returns with our spending which means mm -hmm. that like spending up until a certain point, yes, mm -hmm. will increase levels of happiness and fulfillment. Like, you know, of course, as, as human beings, we want our basic needs met. We want to be able to, you know, have mm -hmm. some, have some nice things, have some wants, yep. have some luxuries, but yep. then you're, but then you're going to reach the top of that fulfillment curve, which is basically like the point that you have enough. You've reached right. the point of sufficiency. Yeah. But what happens is, is we think that like we've been in a period of spending makes me happy. So then we continue doing that. But what ends up happening is that you get to the other end of that curve and it starts to come back down. So yes. any incremental sp spending, acquiring, buying that you do starts bringing down your levels of happiness and fulfillment. Yes. And that's why like for anyone listening to this, if you've ever bought something and then afterwards you're like, you feel terrible right? Yeah. You kind of have this like spending, I call it the spending crash, right? Like mm -hmm. where you buy something and then you have like the buyer's remorse and the shame and the guilt and the crash and you feel awful. And you're like, yeah, I thought this was going to make me so happy. And now I feel terrible. Like what gives, right? It's right. because like 
all of us, to your point, are going to yeah. reach a point where we have enough. And any consuming yeah. that we do past that point will end up consuming us. That's just how it works. Mm. Oh, well said. Very well said. Yeah, I love that. So it's interesting. I, uh, and I don't know if you know this, I lived in Portugal for last few months oh, before fun, I came yeah. back here. To, yeah. So I live there part time of the year and then I RV in the other you know time. But I tell you what it was so interesting when I was over in Portugal, gorgeous place, by the way, I was on the island of Madeira, which is off the coast of Africa. The average income, monthly income there is $800. Oh my gosh. And let me tell you, those are the happiest people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I come back here, as a matter of fact, I mean, I was in Chicago for a few weeks and I was in an area I won't name, but a very, you know, very like kajillion dollar houses, we'll just say. Mm -hmm. And as I walked by them on the street, I didn't have the same feeling as I did uh, with the people that I walked in the, by the streets, you know, in Portugal. Yeah. And they didn't seem happy. They were very unfriendly. And so it goes to show money does not buy happiness. And I think it's like you, you get what you need. And, and it's like you said, too, you reach that point. And it's like, then it's, it's, <laughs> then it's over. Like you just have your necessities. And I, I feel too, especially at midlife, I have found that I'm more, I would, if I'm going to spend money, it's going to be on experiences. It's going to be yes. on things that really create beautiful, wonderful memories because totally. I know, and I've said this before, I'm like, when I'm on my deathbed, I'm not thinking about my pottery barn, pottery barn couch. You know, yeah. I'm not going to be mm -hmm. thinking about that. I'm going to be thinking about, you know, whatever, traveling to Portugal, going to Italy, or even simple things like going out to dinner with my kids. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like yeah. there's certain things no. that, that that really truly does bring that happiness to you. Yeah. Experiences, yeah. You know, and again, like I, I know I'm, I'm saying this a lot, but again, this has also been scientifically <laughs> proven, right? It's true. They're so it's so interesting, though, right? That they like yeah. know this now, and they've done studies around this. But you know, that experiences when when we spend money on experiences, yeah. it makes us much much happier than when we spend money on things. Because yes. I'll, I'll, and I'll kind of tell you why, right? I, I feel like a lot of us like know this, uh -huh. but to actually hear why, you're like, oh, that makes so much sense because products, like a physical product that we buy, when we buy it, as soon as we buy it, that product essentially starts depreciating in our mind, right? Like mm. it's like, think back to like yeah. something that you bought, like, and you bought it and you were so excited for yeah. it. You're like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And now it's literally like stuffed in the back of your closet. You like, don't give to, you know, what's about it. Right. Yeah. So physical products that we buy are going to depreciate over time. Like the second we get them, they're going to start to go down in value in our mind and experiences do the opposite because um. with experiences, it's like, once you have the experience, even after the experience is over, it appreciates. So mm -hmm. to your point, we can think back on it and we can think, oh my gosh, my trip to Portugal, my trip to Italy, that was so amazing. Yes. I got to meet these yep. people. It's like, we get to have that experience as memories. And also oftentimes products are more individual decisions, mm. whereas not always, but most of the time yeah. experiences we experience with other people with and mostly with people that we, that we love and that we're close with, right. With good friends, with family members. So it's just yeah. like the connection to other human beings that's intrinsic in all of us, the fact yeah. that they go up in value. So you know, if you have a thousand dollars to spend and you want to spend it in a way that's going to make you happy, like send it towards the experience rather than buying yourself a physical product. Like right. it's going to make you much happier in the long run. Yep. I think it's amazing that you discovered all this at such a young age. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll say this, like, you know, I'm, I'm 34 now. And mm -hmm. so, you know, my story of impulse shopping, my way through my salary happened 12 years ago. And, mm. you know, people, people hear my story. And I, I do want to say that, like, it certainly did not happen overnight. Mm. Whenever I kind of reached my rock bottom and I knew that something had to change, it's not like, boom, overnight, I was able to like right. turn my financial situation around overnight. Like literally it's taken mm. over a decade. Right. And I'm still, I'm still, I'm still working on it. I still, and I'm working on like my past with money and my history with money, all that sort of stuff. But it it takes time, right? And yep. 
And I, I, I always say too, like I have a lot of women in my community who are in their forties, fifties, sixties, even seventies. And mm. the same thing to me, they come to me and they're like, Paige, it's so great that you were able to figure this out so young, but I don't have that luxury because I'm just now figuring this out, you know, in my forties, fifties, sixties. And what I always say to them is look like timelines, especially when it comes to money, I freaking hate them. Like yeah, <laughs> articles that you see where they're like, this is how much you should have saved by this age. And this is how much you should have. <laughs> I'm like, don't look at those. Don't ever, yeah. ever, ever look at those because all they're going to do is make you feel bad and make you feel behind. Yes, and exactly. I always say like timelines are, they're all made up. They're just BS. Like mm-hmm. the most important thing is that you are making the progress that you want to make. But I always say, mm-hmm. I'm like, listen, thinking that you're too late or thinking that too much time has passed you by the one thing that you cannot do is just say, well, yeah. Oh, well, like might as well just not try. Like Mm -hmm. I've missed the boat. My time has passed. Might as well just not try. Because what I always say is like, look, even if it takes you like it did for me, even if it takes you 10 years to get everything turned around, the 10 years is going to go by. Yep, so exactly. In 10 years, it's like you, you could have taken the 10 years to actually like make the progress that you want to make and turn things around, or you can just say, well, it doesn't matter and stay right. exactly where you are, or maybe even go backwards. Right. So don't ever yeah, think and- that you're behind and don't ever use it as an excuse not to get started. Right. right. Like you said too, you. it's, it's an addiction, right? So then in any addiction, it does take time to, to change your thinking, right? Yes. Yes. And, and to make those changes in your life. So what do you think, um, what do you think it means to have freedom with money? Oh, that's such a good question. So, <laughs> for, so for me, for me personally, like money is about how I feel now. Mm. Like in the past, when I was, you know, in my twenties, money was all about stuff. It was all about what I could buy with it and what it could get me. And Mm -hmm. now money is about a, is about a feeling. So when Mm. you say like, what does freedom look like to you? Like when I think about that, I think about how I feel internally. So freedom to me looks like not having to worry about or think about like, how am I going to pay my bills? Um, you know, I'm, I'm big on getting debt paid off. I don't think it's like the most important thing. And I don't think that like you should sacrifice other things to get debt paid off. But Mm -hmm. I think that being able to say that, you know, you don't owe anyone anything provides a lot of just like mental clarity and a lot of mental freedom. So just for me, it's just like an embodiment. It's, it's, it's a feeling of knowing that like, I'm safe, I'm secure, I'm taken care of. And Mm -hmm. really at the end of the day, like to me, that's freedom. Yeah, right. exactly. Not to have the stress and worry with yeah, money. I know. And mm. it's so, so many of us are so like bogged down by like stress and anxiety and worry yeah. when it comes to money, which is such a shame because yeah. then that becomes the association that you make to money, right? Yep. Like money right. just becomes this thing that's like such a source of pain for people. Um, and getting yourself out of that, like having a healthy relationship with money where you're like, I love my money. My money takes care of me. I know I have what I need. I know I don't have to stress. I know I don't have to worry. Um, to me, for me too. Yeah. When I made this big shift in my life, I felt more empowered. I felt like I took back control over my finances and I was, I was making a lot more money um, during that time, but I used that extra income to get me out of the mess that I was in. Right. So then I, that in itself changed the, I was so grateful for it, for that extra money, instead of like taking that extra money and just blowing it on, you know, a bunch of miscellaneous crap. Right. Yeah. And when I decluttered and Oh my gosh, it's amazing what you find inside the drawers and your closet and it's, cr- and I just pretty much gave it all away. Yeah, no, I know yeah, it just and wasn't. Yeah. I love that point that you touch on because this is something that I tell to, to my clients all the time. As I say, listen, a lot of us who love to spend money and who mm-hmm. have gotten into a habit of spending money, 
we struggle to kind of think about a reality where we're not spending as much or where we're saving. Like a lot of my clients tell me like, I don't even know how to save money. Like I spend everything that I make. Right. So one thing that I tell them to kind of reframe their mindset around, which is kind of like what you said is Mm -hmm. that when you're not spending money, when you're saving it or when you're having it, Mm -hmm. you're still buying yourself something, but what you're buying yourself is something intangible So is it as like maybe fun and sexy, like in the short term? Mm -hmm. No, of course not. But what you're Mm -hmm. buying yourself is, you know, less stress, less worry, more safety, more security. Like you're buying yourself all of these intangible things Mm -hmm. versus Mm -hmm. buying yourself something tangible. Yeah. And what I tell my clients is like, sometimes you have to get into the habit of getting your mindset out of like, saving and spending being these yeah. two things that are like, oh, competing yeah. against each other. you know what I mean? Cause they're really yeah. not like, I always say, save like when you're saving money, what you're saying is I'm still going to get to spend this money. I'm just not going to spend it until much, much later into the future. Right. 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 Let it. And also by saving this money, I'm still buying myself something. I'm yep. just buying myself something intangible And over time, what I find with the women in my community is that Mm -hmm. they start to get more attracted. I don't want to use the word like hooked, but they start to get, Mm -hmm. they start to feel much better about buying themselves the intangible things Mm -hmm. than buying themselves the tangible things. Right. And so saving becomes this like beautiful compliment to their spending and not something that's like competing against the spending. That's so interesting that you said that, that it, it's basically comes down to two choices. You get a dollar, like, what are you going to do with it? You mm-hmm. going to save it or are you going to spend it? Yeah. And, and you, it's got to go one road or the other. And why not let it just sit there? Like what, yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with life? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, maybe and, I'm not going to spend it or save it. Maybe I'm just going to sit there for a little bit. Like who cares? Right. And yeah. there should be, there should be a balance between those, those two choices, right? Mm-hmm. Like in a given month, right. if you have $5,000 coming in to your point, it basically comes down to what am I going to spend right now to support my present yes. day moment? And what am I going to save AKA, what am I going to put away to spend later mm-hmm. on down the road? And right. maybe, you, you, you know, it's like spending a year from now, or mm-hmm. we could be putting it into like a 401k account. And you're like, I'm not going to spend this for another 20, 30 years. Right. Right. But yeah, it just comes down mm-hmm. between those two choices and there's going to be a balance between the two. So right. if, if you're skewed like one way or the other, that's mm-hmm. where, you know, that there's kind of some unhealthy habits coming mm-hmm. in. And I do want to say too, yep. I, I don't typically work with people who have this problem, but you know, being a money hoarder mm-hmm. and not wanting to spend anything Yes. And almost like having like such like a tight grip on your money where it's like painstaking, like just to get you to like spend anything. I feel like we kind of all know people like that. Yeah. That's not necessarily healthy either because that's right. rooted in a lot of fear, scarcity, a lot of limiting beliefs as well. So we don't want to be yep. on either end of the spectrum. We want to kind of be in that healthy, balanced middle part. Mm-hmm. I love it. I've learned yeah. a lot. Good. I'm so good. glad. This is really good. There's so much yeah. to break down here. Honestly, people are like, oh, it's just spending. I'm like, no, no, no. I know. Let yeah. There's tell so you. much no, more no, no. to that. <laughs> so do you teach courses? Yeah. So I have a group mm-hmm. program that's called overcoming overspending and it's open all the time. So anyone can, I don't do like open and close. You can join mm-hmm. at any time because my thing is I'm like, look, if somebody finds me and they are needing yep. help with this, I don't want to have to make them wait. So it's open all the time. It's a group coaching program. So when you join, you're going to get my three phase process to stop overspending. So the three phases is we focus on mindset first, Mm -hmm. and then we focus on emotions. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we get into like the numbers, the black and white, that sort of thing. Right. Whereas yes. most yep. people teaching money are just like, okay, here's the numbers. Here's the, t- it's like, just here's the numbers. The, yeah. Right? It's so much. And more I'm than like, that. no, we got to talk about what's going on up here. We got to talk about what's going on in here. You know, I'm pointing right. to my head and pointing to my heart, like mindset emotions. Mm-hmm. Um, we have group coaching calls every single week. And then you also get private calls with me like one-on-one. Wow. How so, cool. Yeah. yeah I'm it's so, great. I'm I so mean, glad we met. This is, yeah, this is I know. Yeah. And I'll say this, like, again, I want to come back to this point, like wherever you are mm-hmm. age wise, I mean, we have women in my community and their twenties and we have women in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, right? Like I just, this, this problem mm-hmm. really 
it, it doesn't really like discriminate, right? In terms yeah, of you're, you're, and it's, you're never, gamut, so. yeah, and you're never too old to make the change. No, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. Like it's never too late and don't ever think like, oh, I'm too, I, I missed, it's my time, missed the boat. I'm too old to figure this out. It's like, no, no, no. Right. Yep. Because you can make some crazy, amazing shifts and changes and moves. And mm-hmm. like I said, the time's going to pass anyways. So, right. yep, exactly. Yeah. Where can we find you? So on social media, you can find me Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, just search for overcoming underscore overspending. Mm -hmm. And then if you are interested in joining overcoming overspending, my group coaching program that I talked about, you can go to overcoming overspending.com. And I also have a podcast of my own. So if you want to listen to like a good money podcast, um, my podcast is called the money love podcast. So you can find me there as well. Oh, I love it. I love the money love podcast. (laughs) And really, you know what, too, that that also goes back to a good relationship with money to to where you do love it. You love it because you have you have that freedom from it. And you feel feel at peace with it. Yeah. And I think this is the perfect place to kind of like the last thing to offer is just talking about like getting into a loving relationship with your money, because again, when you are in a very like one-sided relationship with your money, kind of like mm-hmm. how I was, right? When you're like, my money is only as good to me as what it will buy me, what it yep. will, what it will do for me, what it will get me. When you're in that one-sided relationship with money, of course, mm-hmm. you're just going to spend it all, right? Because yeah. the because the relationship is unhealthy and toxic. But when mm-hmm. you can form like a really healthy, beautiful, balanced relationship with your money, and yeah. you value it, you become much more selective about what you're going to spend it on. Right. Yeah, so for exactly. me now, like the relationship that I have with money, I'm like, I love my money so mm-hmm. much. I value it so highly that if I'm going to go out and spend it on something, whatever I go and spend it on is going to have to be more valuable to me than my money is to me. Yeah. Which set right. And so I, it's not, it's not being like picky or frugal or like a penny pitcher. I just call it being like a selective spender. You're like, I love my money. And to your point, I love my space. Yep. I love my environment. And I'm going to be selective about what I choose to spend my money on and bring into it because I value it that highly. It's that important to me. Yeah. It's taking control of your your money. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So money. So good, Paige. So good. (laughs) Thank Thank you you for having me. Yes. All right. Have a great day, everyone.